How's it going everyone? This is my blank. Welcome back to my channel and today I've got an interesting one for you. If you're itching for some mouth-wateringly high CPU thread counts, I got just the thing, the Core i9-7900X, which we are going to take a look at right now. So I know this is like 2 months late, but Intel hasn't even gotten to release all of its new X299 platform CPUs. This is still the top-end HEDT high-end desktop part. X299 released in June with a lot of confusion regarding its lineup and proposed value. First of all, there's the 4-core 4-thread and 4-core 8-thread CPUs which straight up offer no added value compared to their LGA 1151 counterparts. What's more, these come with significantly higher TDP and increased platform cost. Secondly, there's the number of available PCI lanes, which for the 8-core 16-thread SKU have actually seen a dive compared to the last generation, Broadwell E, from 40 to 28 lanes now on the new i7-7820X. There's some aspects that have deep roots in how profoundly they affect the new platform, like the fact that motherboard partners theoretically need to have boards with power deliveries able to scale from a low 112 watts for the i5 CPU up to god knows how much an upcoming top-end overclocked i9-7980XC 18-core can consume. Fortunately, one thing's abundantly clear, this launch may have some really questionable decisions, but the root cause for this is one sole thing, competition. We finally have competitiveness in the CPU market and this first response from Intel clearly shows this. Anyway, this is the first Core i9 CPU, dubbed the 7900X, a 10-core 20-thread processor built on Skylake X, Broadwell E's successor. Although stemming from the regular Skylake architecture, Intel's made some definite changes to accommodate the upcoming much higher core count that this platform needs to support. Among these changes is the L3 cache, which is now halved and is now a victim cache, while the L2 is quadrupled at 1 MB. This is a rather big change and should translate into higher IPC as compared to vanilla Skylake. The second big change is Intel's mesh which replaces their ring bus and this is the change needed to support the increased core count and communication between these set cores. This new mesh alongside Intel's decision to move back to an integrated voltage regulator similar to Fiverr on Haswell alongside support for AVX512 translates into new circuitry that obviously requires additional power. And this is clear by looking at the huge power draw that even this 10 core chip can manage stock out of the box. And that's why for peace of mind I had to power the system using an EVGA Supernova G2 850 watt power supply which also comes with dual 8 pin CPU power connectors. Simply put, if you keep it bone stock, meaning no enhanced core boost options that can be enabled on most motherboards, we're looking at 140 watts power draw with peaks around 150 watts. Enabling said enhanced core boosts like Asus Multicore Enhancement does take the CPU a couple of hundred megahertz higher but power draw shoots up to 180 watts continuous and peaks around 190 watts. I couldn't manage more than 4.4 gigahertz at 1.16 volts since I had no chance of cooling it with my Noctua NH-D15 which is a top end air cooler by the way. I did decide to perform all testing with the multicore enhancement turned on since it's a simple on-off switch for a little extra boost in performance that most motherboard manufacturers support by default even. I actually found temperatures pretty decent without this motherboard extra boost turned on but not too bad with it enabled also. We're looking at 73 Celsius on a Noctua D15 with around 52 Celsius while gaming. I didn't manage to go beyond 4.4 GHz as I said earlier since I was severely thermally limited. At 1.16V and 4.4GHz I am already hitting 94C plus peaks during synthetic loads with averages at a very toasty 89C. The chip could even boot at 4.7GHz but throwing any sort of load on it would just be me torturing it honestly as it shoots to 100C while doing light tasks. The system you see in this shot is around $2500 and I've reached this value without even trying. Granted, the motherboard and CPU combo alone are $1350 with the Asus X299 Tough Mark I coming in at $350. Picking a motherboard for X299 is certainly no easy task since the VRing components are under a lot of stress and obviously a board that retails for $200 is not the same as one that's twice that. 
VRM circuitry is extremely important for X299, especially if you overclock. I chose the Tough Mark 1 since it has a solid VRM capable of sustaining the OC'd 7900X and comes with an 8 pin and 4 pin CPU power connector. Clearly, I make use of both at the power draw you saw at 4.4 GHz. Talking about performance now, I'm going to concentrate on real world usage for such a CPU and a little bit of gaming just so you have an idea. Instead of running synthetic benchmarks on the 7900X that don't really show anything useful to the end users, I went ahead and tested in a way that I and many others would certainly use this multi-core beast. I'll start easy with Cinebench, the only synthetic here and one of my favorite CPU tests. Although not included in the graph, I did run tests without Asus Multicore Enhancement, what I keep calling bone stock, and it's around 2008 points. Also, the single thread score is lower when overclocked since the 7900X has a 2 core boost of 4.5 GHz by default, so setting all cores to 4.4 GHz is actually an underclock in such cases. I also chose to include a Ryzen 7 and the 7700K which is a CPU most of us can relate to as it's a third of the 7900X cost. I wish I had a Threadripper as well here but will manage without one for the time being. I kept these two other CPUs overclocked since, well, you know me in overclocking, I don't even run my toaster at stock, let alone high-end unlocked CPUs. Anyway, I saw very interesting behavior in these real-life tests. If we look at general synthetic performance, the 7700K gets its behind handed to it from the 7900X. The 1700X is also around 15-20% to theoretically behind Intel's top HEDT processor. But in real life, things are not so clear cut. Granted, the Premiere Pro export is using CUDA acceleration, so GPU matters the most, that's why there's only a few seconds between all these CPUs, although the 7900X is the fastest. But when it comes to the warp stabilizer test, I actually saw the 1700X hand in better performance. The Cinema 4D animation test is also around 2 minutes faster on the overclocked 7900X. All of this though is also attributed to software which is not really capable of taking advantage of so many cores, a thing I talked about in my Ryzen 7 Switch video. Wondershare's Video Converter Ultimate seems to heavily favor the AMD chip here and I ran the test on the 1700X 3 times with identical results, clearly above 61 FPS. And lastly, WinRAR, which I use a lot for compression and decompression, shows the 7900X at the top and this is actually the fastest time that I've seen on my WinRAR test so far. Well, real case usage shows the overclocked 7900X having the lead in the majority of these tests, but we've yet to look at gaming. Testing was performed with an overclocked GTX 1070, 2100 MHz core clock and 8500 MHz effective VRAM clock at high settings, meaning a notch down from Ultra. I only tested at 1080p to put CPU performance at the forefront. And we've got Battlefield 1 showing the 7700K at the top with the stock 7900X offering good performance but still 15 FPS behind the much lower core count KB Lake chip. I skipped frame times since I found all these CPUs to be around the same general level of performance so there's no need to look deeper in my opinion. Crisis 3 shows a massive 111 FPS 1% low on the overclocked 7900X, which is the highest I've seen in this title. It really is misleading to have the 7700K at top here since there are portions in the game that feel definitely smoother on the two higher core count CPUs, but hey, these are the averages. Watch Dogs 2 again shows the 7700K leading the pack with the highest average and 1% lows. The very high core clock of this CPU generally propels it to the top in gaming, at this point in time at least, when games don't really care for very high thread counts, 16, 20 or even more threads. And lastly, Ashes of the Singularity, which is among the very few games able to spread across lots of threads. And here we do get to see the 1700X being second best, which is very interesting, but I guess the recent Ryzen optimizations the developer made are showing through. Alright, so what's the takeaway here? Well, I'm going to condensate it down to this. At this price point, it's very hard to see how the 7900X slots in with all the current CPU options unless you intensively use AVX512. Now let me break it down. Does this CPU not deliver? Yes, it does, well, most of the time when software is also smart enough to use the available threads. It's clearly fast, has high IPC and can also reach high clocks, at least theoretically depending on motherboard and cooling choices. The latter was no easy feat and is commendable indeed. 
Is cooling it and power draw a problem? Yes and no at the same time. Yes, since the numbers I'm seeing are massive when they could have been better and no, since anyone dropping one grand on the CPU probably has $150 for a top-end PSU and $250 for a custom CPU water loop. So what's the problem then? While the 7900X is only the temporary HEDT top-of-the-line SKU, it has two major thorns in its backside. One of them is Ryzen 7, which needn't be the 1700X I've got here, but merely the $300 1700. Overclocked, it can keep up quite nicely with the 7900X and obviously platform costs are much lower. On the other side, there's Threadripper, which goes after the $999 price tag and comes with an extra 6 cores and 12 threads. So, if you need those extra threads for whatever purpose, then for the same cost you can get 60% more of them. And the last takeaway here, and the most important in my opinion, is that Intel is reacting to the competition and are offering, compared to their equivalent Broadwell E10 Core 6950X, better performance for less cost. So I'll end this by expressing my eagerness to see how Coffee Lake is going to further shake things up later in the year. Alright guys and gals, let me know your thoughts on the X299 platform and the 7900X in the comments down below. Also let me know if you think the upcoming 4, 6 and maybe even 8 core Coffee Lake CPUs are going to invalidate their X299 equivalents. While you're at it, don't forget to check out my Twitter and Patreon pages linked in the description down below. And thank you for supporting this channel by subscribing. See you next time everybody, bye bye.